Hello, and welcome to episode 26 of On Liberty, coming to you live from the Center for Independent Studies in Sydney, Australia. I'm your host, Salvatore Babonis, and joining me today is John Anderson, former Deputy Prime Minister of Australia. I'll be talking to John about the importance of civic institutions in forming cohesive societies and fostering democracy. John Anderson, how are you? I'm well. It's terrific to be with you and with the CIS. <laughs> We're absolutely thrilled that you found the time to join us today. Look, you write on your own website that, quote, freedoms are hard won, fragile, and anything but the norm. How do we keep our freedoms if that's the challenge? Well, it's a very good question. Uh, and the undermining and loss of confidence in our institutions today at a time of great social fragmentation makes it more important than ever, in my view, to think carefully about whether we value freedom, because it's not a taken, mm -hmm. and what we're prepared to do to defend it. And we need to remember, too, that people will always opt for security over freedom if they feel threatened and insecure. I think in Australia it's important to remember that although we've been prepared to fight to preserve freedom and the heroism uh, that we saw in Australian fighting forces uh, in, the, in the Great Wars and so forth uh, reflect that, we didn't have to fight to secure freedom in the first place. We've not known tyranny and oppression uh, and the devaluing of the importance of uh, huge numbers of people in our society in the way that our European forebears and others in many societies, in fact, the norm really down through the ages, have experienced. So uh, it's a bit like eyesight. It's one of those things that until you've lost it, perhaps you don't fully value it. You just assume it'll be there, but it won't. And there are massive forces internally and externally now for every Western nation that need to be confronted, forces that are opposed to our way of life and to our freedoms. And in one way, perhaps it's best summarised by saying, if you think of the four great revolutions of recent years, you could really say five if you counted the English Revolution. But let's just take four, the American, the French, the Maoist, and the uh, Russian revolutions. They were all supposedly about securing freedom, but only one really did. And that was the American Revolution. And it's great centerpiece was how do we secure freedom given that we all have a propensity to uh, you know resort to mob rule to degrade the rights of individuals and what have you and this very careful balancing and the setting up of institutions the separation of powers respect for office respect for the different officers and their office holders all part and parcel of setting up a machinery that as one american put it we're so good we had to give ourselves a vote, we're so bad we have to give ourselves a vote. It's deeply rooted in, a, in, in an understanding of the dual nature of human beings, the nobility uh, and the, 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 the tendency to be selfish and how to hold those in balance. Well, it's funny you said these are four recent revolutions and you went all the way back to 1776, so that's some kind of sense of history. Uh, you know, my own family came to the United States or went to the United States uh, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, they didn't have to fight for freedom. Uh, I think very few people in America today have had any real personal connection with a struggle for liberty. And yet America remains a freedom-loving country. So is it really about that personal struggle or is it something more institutional? Well, I think that's a very good question. I think it can be both. It's personal in the sense that if you if you just assume it's there and it's your right and it's going to be there tomorrow, you won't want to defend it and you won't recognise the dangers. And I think the danger, the great danger in a way. See, people laugh at this and say, oh, that's just uh, somebody from the right of centre, you know, inventing terms. But you talk about the long march of the left through the institutions. Well, what, it was a real thing. It was deliberate. It was spearheaded by people who had serious agendas. The, you know, the Frankfurt School uh, uh, starting in Germany in the 1920s did exist. Gramsci was a powerful writer in Italy in the 1930s. What were they on about? Well, they believed, they were communists, they believed that the revolution wasn't happening. Quickly enough, uh, those were not rising up to overthrow the bourgeoisie. Why not? 
Well, it's the institutions in these Western cultures. They're too strong. They've had too much of a hold on people, so they, they won't fight for their liberty, uh, and liberty as they saw it was communism, whereas slowly the rest of the world was beginning to see that it was anything but liberty. Uh, nonetheless, their conclusion was that the answer was to weaken those institutions, whether it was a family, whether it was civic society and the, the, the platoons, uh, the, the, the small platoons that Edmund Burke talked about going about their jobs with their football clubs and their involvement in their church and their volunteer organisations and their firefighting outfits and what have you, right through to attacking the judiciary, the parliamentary, confidence in the parliamentary system and so forth. They've been highly successful, highly successful. You can see that in the research that shows the extraordinary level of doubt now, extraordinary, in democratic capitalism, particularly amongst young people. You can also see it in the catastrophic collapse of trust in our institutions and the people who people those institutions, if I can put it that way, think the banking inquiry, that's one illustration. Although there's a rub, isn't there? COVID has reflected that we want to trust somebody to look after us. We want governments to look after us, whether or not that trust is overly confident and misplaced is yet to be seen, as we see some governments apparently intent on using COVID to establish a new authoritarianism. <laughs> You're stealing my thunder there. <laughs> uh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, John, uh, look, thanks. Uh, thanks for the plug. Uh, my book, The New Authoritarianism, published in 2018. But let me just say some quick hellos. It's quite well read in Australia. I understand it's quite well read. And thank um, you very I much. I, she did, and I know you've read it, and I really appreciate it. Look, I want to say some quick hellos. Elizabeth in Sydney is watching. Anthony, Elizabeth in New Jersey is watching. Mango, uh, Maping Mango again is here. Pepe, Gay, Kathleen. Thank you all for watching today. We'll get to your questions soon. Uh, Courtney, hello. We'll get to your questions soon. Please start feeding them in through the chat box and we'll get there. Um, John, you mentioned in passing how the freedom agenda you know, is somehow associated with right-wing politics. Yeah, I think anyone who believes in freedom recognizes that the historical right-wing of politics has been anathema to freedom. That, that is, people who believe in freedom are by no means right-wing. Uh, why do you think there's been this conflation of loving freedom with you know, fascism and Nazism, which is just patently ridiculous? Well, I think it is ridiculous. And I don't have a neat answer to it, except to say that what we generally and loosely call the West, the left, has, has moved enormously. The left used to be about concern for the working classes and the marginalised and the dispossessed. Today, it is far more likely to be about identity-based uh, uh, political issues and the environment. And very often, the truth is that a modern figure on the left actually is not only disinterested in working class people, but is inclined to think of them as the problem. They're the people who want have aspirational, material aspirations, and they want uh, you know, two motor cars and a plasma television that churns out a whole lot of filth that destroys Gaia, the planet. So you've had this absolutely massive shift. Uh, and of course, I suppose you'd say that the left of centre tends to think, well, these people aren't going to give up all these terrible aspirations, so we need to gain control. The state needs to expand its reach and its influence. So in many ways, I don't know that the old left-right paradigm works so much anymore. It's more a question of who believes evidence who wants to look at what works, what hasn't worked from a historical perspective on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, those who uh, you know, still believe in individual liberty and individual conscience and freedom, to use that word again, versus the encroaching status view of, uh, you know, nanny knows best. Well, and I think that's a real dilemma for us. That status view, it's uh, ironic you should bring that up because the status view is so closely associated with in people's imagination with a nordic model with sweden denmark norway finland yet you know ever since the coronavirus hit we've been hearing incessantly about the swedish model quote unquote which seems to be anything but statist <laughs> if anything it's the you know australia's and britons of the world that have been statist while sweden has just said uh, individual freedom uh, trumps these sort of uh, draconian public health restrictions that health experts want to bring in. 
what are your own thoughts on you know, Nordic capitalism and the Swedish model? Well, it's a very good question because we know from, again, from the research that staggering numbers of our young people have lost confidence in democratic capitalism. And many, uh, or close to half, as I understand it, in both Australia and uh, America, and I think in Britain, the voting numbers would suggest it's the same. Countries that have been based, uh, you know, and have seen enormous prosperity and, and opportunity grow out of democratic capitalism, no longer believe in their own system. Now, let me say up front that I can understand why many young people who've not been steeped in a deep, real education about how freedom was won and who are experiencing the fallout of what I would see, I don't think you can call it anything else, crony capitalism. In many ways, capitalism has run off the rails. And so you had the great financial crisis, which was really the result of, there's no other way of putting it, moral failings of the sort that we saw here reflected in the Banking Royal Commission. You know, the buck's more important than the way you behave. The AMP was the most trusted institution after the churches, according to Geoffrey Blaney, uh, for many decades in this country. And yet, look how it came out of the Royal Commission. People think, well, you can't trust them. And the other thing that's happened is that after the GFC, in an attempt to get the horrendous debts in the West under control, Governments and central banks have been trying to generate inflation, and it hasn't worked. The only thing that's happened is that the very low interest rates have made the wealthy wealthier, those who have assets, and young people confronted with big student debts, the difficulties of getting meaningful employment at a rate that will help them pay back the debts, and not being able to break into the asset market, namely houses, uh, as easily as their parents and grandparents did, they become disillusioned. However, in the search for an alternative, they're looking in precisely the wrong place. And the Swedish countries or the Nordic countries are held up as examples of what we ought to be. Several points to try and make very quickly. Firstly, if you really want to see socialism, look at Venezuela. That's a better model as to what you'll get. Because secondly, the Scandinavian countries are actually free enterprise, extraordinarily so. They're very small. Their total population is only about the same as Australia's. They're very cohesive. They are strongly welfare inclined. They have relatively flat wages and they're prepared to pay a lot of tax, but they generate the wealth for all of that model on amazingly open free enterprise societies. It's easier to do business in a lot of those countries than it is in places like Australia and Germany and America. Mm. So they are not socialist countries technically uh, or even in flavor. Uh, they have other qualities that mean that they can work very well. So you look at the, the COVID issue and people are looking at Sweden and there's some early numbers suggesting their approach has worked. But that has more to do with social cohesion and cooperation and a high level of trust, which we don't see in America, regrettably. And that pains me to say that because I'm a great admirer of America and increasingly we're not seeing in Australia. So sorry, a long answer, but it's an important one because we know our young people are looking around for an alternative. They feel the system's not delivering. And, and with Bernie Sanders in the US, much of the union movement in this country, they're all saying, let's do it the way Scandinavia does. Well, Scandinavia is not a socialist model. It's a free enterprise model, and it's highly socially cohesive. Two big challenges for us uh, who think that the answers lie there. Well, that's a long answer that opens up a lot of new questions. Uh, so I, I know that in the post-war era, Certainly in Scandinavia, there was a nationalization of industries to put them under state ownership. And even in the UK, under the Labour government after World War II, there was a widespread nationalization of industries. All sorts of household names in British industry were turned into state companies. But all that's gone now, right? I, I mean, is, yeah. is Sweden still a center of state ownership? No. no. No, they tried it and it was a disaster. Everyone forgets that. In the 80s, uh, 70s and 80s, they went for a, 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 a socialist model, staggeringly high rates of taxes. They lost their wealthiest man. He right. went to uh, yeah, his mum yeah. and he went to Switzerland. Uh, and that was, of course, uh, the Lego man, Mr. Lego. Um, and they learnt the price of taxing the wealthy to pieces. You lose your best entrepreneurs, the people who create the wealth and the jobs. Uh, and I say that as somebody who frankly thinks a lot of our executives in this country uh, are overpaid. I don't like the way they reward themselves. It's opened up too much of a gap. Nonetheless, you don't solve your problems by soaking the rich and driving away your entrepreneurs. Britain, of course, did the same thing. 
And I, it, it was a staggering moment in my life when I realised that uh, after the um, the election that the uh, that the, uh, May nearly lost, when we looked at the number of young people who voted for the socialists, because I thought to myself, not so long ago, that as a young person, I looked at Britain that was broken. It went to the the International Monetary Fund, this once proud nation, cap in hand, because socialism had almost bankrupted and the place was a complete mess. I went there as a 23-year-old and I couldn't get over the sense of hopelessness and helplessness amongst young people because they, they said, if the bomb doesn't get us, I don't know what will because we can't get a job, our country's broken, there's no opportunities. Now, Thatcher is now re, you know, reviled by the West, but actually she had the courage to turn Britain around. You know, to do what they did in Sweden. They woke up, they cut their taxes, they moved away from socialism, they encouraged free enterprise again, and Britain recovered. So the lessons of history, you know, we are destined to repeat them. You know, can, have we really forgotten? It was only a few short decades ago that Britain and Sweden were in diabolical shape because of socialism. Well, I have one last question for you based on what you've just said before we go to viewer questions. Viewers, Please do get those questions in. We'll get to them in just two minutes. John, you're probably aware that in 2018, the Center for Independent Studies conducted a survey that showed that more than half of Australian millennials had a favorable view of socialism. That was even higher among university-educated Australian millennials. And an even higher percentage believed or agreed with the statement, quote, capitalism has failed. Yet, do those young people really want to work in state industries, or do they simply misunderstand what socialism and capitalism means? Well, as I say, I don't entirely blame those young people. Uh, you know, the march of the left through the universities where profit is a dirty word, despite the fact that it's profit that's lifted people out of poverty, given them jobs, opportunities, and paid for those university staffers' jobs, and no other system's been able to do it. Uh, you know, you, you have to have some sympathy for young people. And Capitalism, democratic capitalism, we have been let down too often by people behaving badly, both politically and in business circles. I know that. But the answer is to fix them and to return to the days when a man, a woman's word was their bond. You could trust them. They were plainly dedicated to uh, doing the right thing and didn't have to be coerced. Uh, that's the answer. The answer is not to go to a place where history shows us very plainly the loss of individual identity, the, the collectivization uh, of, um, uh, of your lives uh, in so many ways from education through to the workplace, through to even the choices you can make. You know, I mean, here's the old quip that Reagan used to devastating effect against the Russians when he was attacking the system and highlighting how terrible command economies actually were. Uh, Yuri orders a new Volga motor car. Uh, and he's told it'll arrive in seven years, five months and three days uh, and on such and such a date. Uh, and he says, oh, he says, well, uh, uh, can you just tell me, will that be in the morning? Will that be in the afternoon? And the, the man at Volga says, good grief, it's se over seven years away. What does it matter? And Yuri replies, well, it's just I've got a doctor's appointment in the afternoon on that day. You know, history is there to guide us. The greatest mistake we are making is ignoring the richness of history in, in, in providing an understanding of the traps that we can easily fall into uh, if, if, uh, if we cast around for a better way rather than recognising what we need to do is make the necessary alterations to restore rather than to tear down what we actually have. Well, it's looking like our viewer questions will give us ample opportunity to talk about the importance of history. In the meantime, I'm in the here and now, and I'd like to ask you to give a thumbs up to that video. If not for me, then do it for John. Uh, we need that because the more people like the videos, of course, the more people will see them. So by encouraging, other, by encouraging YouTube to think that we're doing well, you actually spread news about the program. So we appreciate your support. Also, click that support link. We should have uh, in the comment section a support link for the CIS. If you're not already a member, please become a member. It's only $40 to become a member of the Center for Independent Studies. That'll carry you through for an entire year. But if you join at the $250 level, and I know everyone loves this pitch, or if you upgrade to $250, 
I will personally send you a signed copy of Liberty and Liberalism by Bruce Smith, the first work of classic liberalism published in Australia by an Australian author. And John, that applies to you too. Uh, if you want to uh, up your membership, I'm sure you're already a member. Uh, I'll send you a copy of Liberty and Liberalism. We'd love to have it. Look, everyone subscribe to the channel. With more subscribers, again, the more thumbs up we get. It's not so much that we're vain about it. It's that every time you interact with the video, that encourages YouTube to show it to other people. And we just want to get the word out. Um, John, we have a comment more than a question from Pepe, but it uh, is really right up your alley, I think. He's asking that classic question, do people who value security over freedom deserve neither? Uh, well, that was, I think it was Churchill that said that, wasn't it? Uh, who, who did say that? Someone said that. Someone very I, famous. I, I don't have Wikipedia <laughs> handy. <laughs> <laughs> Someone put um, it in the comments for me. But, but it's, a, you know, look, it is worth pondering. It is worth pondering. You know, if there's nothing worth dying for, is there anything worth living for? You know, we need to ask ourselves the hard questions. How much do we value freedom? It really does matter. Ask a Chinese person whether a 400 million closed circuit televisions and facial recognition, uh, and if you go jaywalking, you lose a few points. If you do something really serious like criticise the government, you lose a heap of points. Uh, if you work hard at school, you might pick up a few points uh, and your point score will determine everything from the internet speed you're able to access to whether you can go on holidays uh, and uh, whether you can have a job. You know, freedom is a real thing. It's a real thing. And uh, we need to be very, very careful, I think, uh, in, in, in establishing what we want for ourselves and for our children. Um, enslavement can come from despotic government. Uh, it can also come from indebtedness, by the way, as the American forefathers recognised. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm for freedom and I'm for personal responsibility. Now, Elizabeth uh, here in Sydney uh, points out something I think that people so often forget. I, I mean, among especially among conservatives, there's a lot of, frankly, moaning about how the left this, the left that. Yet she points out conservatism is the dominant politics in the modern world. Yet even when, and even when conservatives are not in power, conservative ideas and policies set the shape for society and the economy. So first I wanna ask, is that true? But she's asking, is that threatened? Uh, well, I, I believe it's only partially true. I mean, I don't really, I mean, for example, I don't believe President Trump, he's painted as conservative by people, as conservative by people who don't like him, but I don't think he's a thought through to be honest, I, I suspect politically you have no particular fixed philosophical address. He's more of a pragmatist uh, and Australians like pragmatists, but you need undergirding principles as well. Um, and so I would say that I'm not certain that any of the great political streams are really strongly defended, either conservatism, liberalism, or even what I would call the old fashioned noble socialism, because there was a brand of that where there was a desire to ensure that the weak and the oppressed will fully recognise as a human family, uh, you know, family Australia, family America or whatever. Now, I might have vehemently disagreed with the way they wanted to achieve it, but the objective was not anything uh, to be despised at all. Uh, but those strands have all broken down very badly, and I'm not certain that that's a good thing. You need principles from which you seek to argue the case for your view of where a society should go and without those principles, what you see is what I would say we're really seeing at the moment, a great deal of ad hocery and managerialism without much vision and without a lot of thought leadership that challenges people, that educates people, that gives them the confidence that if they delay gratification now, et cetera, work hard, we can actually hand something really good on to our children. So we tend to go for the short term. Let's just try and make it through. Uh, you know, this patch uh, and survive through into the next lot. Well, the options are running out, not least of all because of indebtedness. We're just building up horrendous levels of indebtedness. We solved the debt crisis 12 years ago with mountains more debt. If you have a look at the graphs, with the exception of a few places like Germany, uh, we basically doubled our debt to GDP ratios in most Western countries. It was inevitably be another shock. It's come with COVID. Uh, there will be another one sometime. It might be a decade. It might be two decades. We hope it'll be three or four away, but there will be another one. And if it hits Western economies, particularly when they're as deeply in debt as they are at the moment, well, 
So I would say that I'm not certain that what we're seeing at the moment isn't more of a nature of ad hoc managerialism and crisis management than any particular political philosophy that's clearly setting a vision for the future. Now, I think a lot of people listening would just automatically consider you a conservative politician. But from hearing you talk, I think of you more as, okay, I, I know this is, I, I don't want to be brown nosing, a principled politician. And, and principles are, are not necessarily conservative, but somehow we've seen this conflation in popular debate yeah. that if you have principles, that means you're conservative. I mean, you've been here on the show today criticizing bankers, criticizing CEOs, mm. you know, yeah. where, uh, lauding uh, the low levels of inequality and high levels of social solidarity in Sweden. What's conservative about that? Well, uh, maybe a misunderstanding of what real conservatism is, but I don't know that I'd want, I don't like wearing labels. Right. Uh, and so you've just said a very kind thing. I think principles matter hugely. And I think the first principle in a, in a governmental sense, I'm with Peter Hitchens on this, one of the conversations I had with him, he, he made the observation, I said, what do you think is the thing we ought to fight to preserve first and foremost? And he said, the rule of law. Teddy Roosevelt made the comment that no one should be above the law and no one should be below the law. And I think that's where I start, to be honest. So, I mean, in economic terms, I'd probably more broadly line up as a liberal in terms of um, the universalism of the old socialists, where everybody's recognised as part of the human family. I find that deeply attractive. Uh, modern socialism, well, I just find it a complete and utter disaster. And the idea of a new aristocracy of real or perceived victims um, and the idea of racism, which is now basically merged into the idea that all whites are supremacists and nobody except whites are racist, to me is just idiocy. Uh, but the part of conservatism, Salvatore, that really appeals to me more than anything else is this. A conservative recognises that human nature never changes. Uh, every one of us is capable of nobility. Every one of us is capable of selfishness. And we need to draw out the best but be realistic about the worst uh, and, and I don't think we should ever lose sight of human nature, and it should redouble our efforts to try and ensure the strength of our institutions so that we can handle the nobility and the inclination to do the wrong thing at the same time. Now, I have a question here from Winton, and this is maybe not fair to ask of someone who is a, a professional farmer and a practical <laughs> politician. Uh, but the question is, would you describe yourself as more of a Hayekian or a Burkean? <laughs> ah. Friedrich Hayek, right? Probably a Burke. <laughs> Probably. I found him very appealing. You know, he left he, he, uh, his deathbed, though. Here's an interesting thing for you. Um, not many people know this, but a little factoid from history, I understand. Burke spent his last three days reading William Wilberforce, the great anti-slavery campaigner book. He wrote a book. These publishers said, oh, it's a religious book, Mr. Wilberforce. It won't sell, but your name on it, we might sell 500 copies. Well, it went through 19 editions in seven languages or something, and you can still buy, literally still buy it today if you go looking, new versions of it. And Burke spent his last three days reading that book, and it was called Real Christianity, the difference between what people think it is and what it really is. <laughs> so that's, that's where Burke landed up. And I would have said that, uh, you see, I, you, you paid me what I regard as a compliment a moment ago, I would have said that Wilberforce was a man of enormous principle, guided by principle, who sometimes took positions that no one would ever have expected a man of great wealth from a capitalist background to take. In fact, he basically spent his fortune, which in today's terms would have been around $400 million, a lot of money, he basically spent it pursuing good causes like educating kids when there was no public system uh, and fighting slavery. Uh, reminds me of uh, Australia's own uh, Paul Ramsey in in a way. Yeah, very, very generous man. And perhaps not recognised enough and honoured enough. And I must say that I find it truly tragic that in our educational institutions, to cut to the chase, it seems to me that there's been an enormous willingness to allow all sorts of foreign study institutes, uh, Islamic and Chinese included, to set up on our universities. It then emerges that they were not really 
uh, under the control of the university. So we're pretty much autonomous, a lot of these little uh, groupings. But, oh, no, we can't have a centre for the study of Western civilization because they'll want to do their own thing. Right. And then well, what? Whatever. I think they need to be very careful in this country. They are losing the confidence of the public fast. Well, whatever people may think of the Ramsey Center for Western Civilization, to vilify Paul Ramsey, who uh, you know, contributed his entire fortune to good causes, uh, is just unbelievable. So uh, I'm sure you're with me on that. We're not going to have any controversy here. Uh, look, Anthony wants to ask, years ago, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, I remember Jeffrey Blaney saying that communism was not permanently dead. It would arise again in a new form. Do you think that is happening? Yes, I do. Uh, they never give up. And uh, they're clever. They're organised. They are in search of a, a nirvana, a utopia uh, in theory, uh, that, um, which, which always beggars description to, to, me, to my way of thinking. You see, I think communism is flawed in theory as well as in practice. I don't think it's good enough to say that communism is just uh, only, only gone wrong because it's never been properly tried. I think the the, the the falsity at its heart is the idea that human beings like you and I and our listeners will give our loyalty to the party ahead of our loyalty to our loved ones and our local community and even our country. Yet that's what communism always demands, total loyalty, and then it becomes the arbiter of what is right and wrong. There are no objective exterior reference points. There's no common law. There's no accepted sort of case law and precedent. Uh, that's why 98.5% or whatever it is of prosecutions in China succeed. Uh, you know, I don't know what it is in Australia, but it would be vastly less than that. I'll tell you, the number, the, is similar, the number is similar for America. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <Well, laughs> um, but I get your point. I get your point. Uh, look, Gay, Gay wants to ask, are we in the so-called West, and I guess so-called because Australia is not very far West of anywhere, just about, are we in the so-called West? now seeing socialism as necessary to survival, and I'm guessing she means in context of the uh, coronavirus pandemic, rather than being something to be despised? I think it's a very, very good question indeed. And I find it amazing that in Victoria, the polling showing that Dan Andrews is still receiving strong support for the very draconian measures that he's put in place and the extraordinary powers that he's essentially had voted uh, for, for for his regime, and, and um, it, it's it's a it, it is very troubling because we've looked to government. There's a resurgence of de a desire to trust government to keep us safe, uh, and freedom isn't coming into the equation very much at all. And it's already doing a lot of damage in ways that are not being talked up. For example, we're worried about our health. Why is it that your own university and my old alma mater? I gather that in the medical department, there's a very capable unit uh, on mental health, I can't remember its name, which estimates that our normal suicide rate in Australia at 3,000 or so a year will escalate to four and a half because of COVID and the lockdowns and the mental health implications, and that half of them will be young people. So there's a social cost directly related to people's health, their mental health, that is not being weighed against the cost of the lockdowns and the cost of increasing, well, for want of a better word, the drift towards statism. And I would challenge my fellow Australians, we need to stop and think about the way in which we outsource our responsibilities. Even, I would suggest, the tendency to now want to outsource the raising and socialisation of our children to the state. You know, who's calling the shots here? I want governments to be a function of society rather than us being a function of governments. And, and, you know, I think it's a very good question. And, look, I don't know what the answer is going to be, but I'm, I'm actually a bit worried about Australians on this one. I know you are a passionate believer in robust, noisy, heated democracy of the sort that the Americans have really specialised in for a long time, have now built into something that's perhaps a little bit dangerous in my view. It's got a bit overheated. Uh, but perhaps we're the other way around. We might be a little bit too apathetic. Well, let me ask you, you just brought in that issue of community. Something I find very surprising is that it, uh, 
if you really believe in community, you should want things like local school boards, like parents being involved in the school mm. curriculum. Yet what we see from communists and fellow travelers and socialists is a desire to have all of that centralized and put under the control of, well, frankly, themselves. Uh, do we want community or do we want communism? Those should be akin, but somehow they seem entirely separate. Uh, I agree. Well, it's a great problem. So the, the, here's the flaw at the heart of communism. People will not give their loyalty to the party and to its doctrines voluntarily, so they have to be forced, which means you've got to increase the reach and the power of the state all the time. And the only thing that will prevent that is a vigilant population saying, no, you're not going to socialise my children. I have grandchildren now and I'm looking at them thinking how much I love them and how innocent they are because I live on a farm and I see them growing up in a wonderful native environment and all the rest of that sort of, not native is the wrong word, but free environment, what have you. Um, and I sort of think to myself, I hope their parents realise that they're shortly to be engaged in a massive battle for the hearts and souls of their children. Um, who was Who is going to be the dominant socialiser in those children's lives? Their parents and their family, including their extended family, at the village, if you like, or will it be the people who set the curriculum? And I don't like the way the curriculum is set. I really don't like it. There's far too much emphasis, for example, on um, the early sexualization of children. I can't put it any other way. We introduce our children at ridiculously early ages to notions uh, around um, their own identity uh, that I think, in ways that I think are very unhelpful, far too early. Just to give one example, but then you look at the way in which history is taught, uh, you look at the way in which our own culture and democratic capitalism is decried and blamed for every ill. It's not pointed out that the massive improvement in people's opportunities and in lifespans across the world has been the direct result of the innovation, of the science, of the technology and the compassion and concern for human rights that has really originated essentially in that loosely term uh, idea of the West, because that's where most of those ideas and that technologies come from. I'm a farmer. Uh, lifespans have doubled because of better foodstuffs. Australia took part in the Green Revolution. It has absolutely changed opportunities for people right throughout our region and infinitely for the better. Now, that didn't come from communist Russia. It didn't come from you know, any of the despotic, uh, nasty regimes around the world that became actually technologically quite backward and saw people as cannon fodder uh, for the party machine or for whatever war was going on, rather than as individuals worthy of respect and worthy of a real attempt to give them opportunity and hope. Now, Leslie's asking, why can our serious newspapers not give clarity like John Anderson? Now, that's a great opportunity for you to tell our viewers where they can find you, because you're very easy to find online. Well, I mean, thank you for the compliment. I, I, must say I think there are some marvellous writers in the Australian media. And uh, whilst I, I, I know exactly what you're driving at and confidence in the mainstream media has been plummeting, no, no. of course. Don't, don't be self-deprecating. Tell us about your <laughs> podcast. <laughs> it was well, awesome. I want um, our viewers to go listen to it. Well, two and a half years ago, uh, a friend and I, we were talking about uh, the way in which you can't get good public policy without a good debate. So we thought, well, Let's try and just make accessible in this new form, social media, some of the world's better thinkers, whether we agree with them or not. And so we set up the John Anderson uh, conversations at johnanderson.net.au. And I interrupt very little. In fact, sometimes a professional journalist, a mate of mine, said to me the other day, John, you never press them enough. You don't question them. And I said, no, that's not the idea. I'm trying to let people hear unfettered what others have to say. And that's what we do. And we've been a bit startled by how well it's gone and how many people uh, uh, listen. The, the raw numbers are quite staggering. Um, we've been going a bit over two years, and I think we're somewhere between seven and eight million YouTube downloads Ooh, wow. alone. And then you add social media and Facebook and podcasts over and above that. And people pull me up all the time. And look, all I'm doing, I'm being a conduit. And people broadly pick up uh, where, where I'm coming from. But, you know, it's a fascinating thing to talk to somebody who, for example, is from left of centre, who says we're making a terrible job in the, of socialising our children because we're, 
we're not developing resilience and what he calls anti-fragility. That's, that's Jonathan Haidt, who's a wonderful man and very engaging and very humane man. Uh, and so our children are becoming, I think some people call it snowflakes. And who are the biggest losers from that? Our children. Because we haven't taught them to grow through the inevitable tough times and the disappointments of life. We've pretended we can wash them away. Well, what happens when you can't wash them away? And no. you need courage and resolve and insight and backbone to see it through. Now, John, this is a point at which we normally start wrapping up, but can I ask you to stay on with us for another five minutes because we have a few more questions I'd love to get your viewpoints on. So if that's okay with you, all right. Yeah. Uh, look, Anthony wants to know, do you think that an emphasis on group rights rather than individual rights leads to identity politics and division of a nation into tribes? In short, is multiculturalism a weakness or a strength? Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, look, if by multiculturalism you mean enjoying other people's food uh, and uh, their dances and their uh, um, art and those sorts of things, I'm all for it. If you mean that we should somehow surrender the cultural foundations of our own freedoms and prosperity, I have to say I'm troubled. And remember that both David Cameron, a conservative in Britain, and Angela Merkel, perhaps the standout leader in Europe of the last uh, uh, however long, have both said multiculturalism has failed their society. So it's not as if I'm alone in making that observation. I think there are real dangers. I think the form of identity politics that you're now seeing, uh, yeah, probably originates as much as anything else uh, from... Um, people who feel victimised looking to take advantage of other people who feel victimised and will justify their position. Uh, but imagine, I think of the terrible life my father led, you know. Outwardly, you'd say he was a white privileged male. But he was caught up in the, one of the most horrendous battles of the Second World War. He went within an ace of losing his life. He never really recovered. He had massive personal tragedies to deal with. What if he'd played the victim card? Well, he didn't. What if the Jewish people after the Holocaust had played the victim card? Life is tough. We need to learn to cope with it. But the answer is not to pretend that some empathy culture can solve all of our personal problems and that all we need to do is to organise into ghettos of people who are fellow victims and then demand that the rest of society fix up our problems for us. You'll end up with nobody left to fix them up. So it's another way of saying it's time we focused on the things we have in common and less on the things that divide us. It doesn't matter where you are in Australia, what your gender is, what the colour of your skin is, what your age is. You all have an interest. Every one of us has an interest in freedom, in security and in educational opportunities, employment opportunities and a reasonable degree of prosperity. So what do we do to secure those things? Because division is actually threatening all of them. We're going to have to move to wrap up, but I, I do I can't resist throwing one more question at you coming from Pepe, and it's the crucial one, I think. Uh, he says, my friends are very apathetic towards politics and government. What can we do? Well, uh, you know, I've seen people apathetic about their workplace health and safety, and then they lose a limb or lose an eye, and they suddenly realize what they've lost. Um, I can only join with and uh, a, a conversation with, uh, that I held uh, with on my website uh, from Stanford. And he said, every one of us now, it's very late in the day, needs to engage in the conversation with our friends around the bar, at the picnic, wherever it is, uh, and accept that some people now are unable to hold a reasoned debate. It's very threatening. But we simply have to, if necessary, simply by asking polite but firm questions. Oh, is that what you think? Why? What's the evidence for that? Where will it lead? What about those who have an opposing view um, before it's too late? Because history tells us again and again and again that, uh, that cultures can fail and we are in danger of eating ourselves out from within. And that's why the work that you do, and I, I say this very seriously, uh, your books, your writings, um, your appearances 
the Center for Independent Studies. Look, under, under its new leadership, I really admire the way they're now recognizing culture matters. You see, if, and for years, the CIS was very focused on, the, and I was the same, on how you get the economic policy settings right to make an economy work. We now need to recognize you've got to address the cultural issues first. You won't get the settings right for democratic capitalism if our young people no longer believe it's the right model. So you've got to address the cultural divisions and loss of confidence in our way of life as much as, if not more than, the issue of what policies we adopt in economic terms, in taxation terms, in trade terms and so forth to pull ourselves out of COVID-19 and the very serious malaise that the world is now in, Australia included. John Anderson, thank you sincerely for joining us today. Much appreciated. It's been an absolute pleasure. I really enjoyed it. All right. I'd also like to thank our producer, Emily Holmes, executive producer, Max Hawk Weaver, the director of CIS is Tom Switzer. And next week, at a special time, it'll be delayed one hour, it'll be 11 o'clock, Carlos Debrera. Thanks, everyone, for watching, and we look forward to talking to you next week.